right, well today, I want to have a conversation with you. I, I invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke 14, 7 to 14. And this is going to be a sermon, but I, I hope that it's more a talk, it's more of a conversation. Um, because this topic that I'm going to talk to you about today and that you've kind of seen a little bit up here about Lent, this really is something that, that is about all of us. Today, we're going to be talking about something. You can come up too, yeah. It's like two students left and went to the bathroom, came back, and what happened? Everybody. Um, we all make choices, don't we? And students especially, what I want you to know, what I want you to hear from me as much as possible is that the choices that you make now are going to be the life that you live later on. The person that I am today the person that your mom and dad is today is a result of the choices that they made before. And so choices are really important. Choices shape who we are and who we're becoming. And so if we're Christian, I know this may sound obvious, but I have learned in my preaching that you can never be too obvious. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you want to make Christian choices, right? Right? And sometimes what we're going to find today is that Christian choices are not always obvious to us. So let's kind of go through this. I have a little outline for you, but today isn't as much about filling in the blanks as it is just about thinking this thing through. And the first thing I want you to understand is that doing what comes naturally is not always my best choice. Doing what comes naturally. See, what makes today's talk so challenging and Students, I want you to know this too. What, what makes what we're talking about today so tough is that sometimes the things that feel like they should be right aren't right. Sometimes things that don't feel like they should be right are actually the right things to do. And so how do you know the difference? I mean, some things, you know, right from wrong. But what we're going to see today is where sometimes the right and the wrong aren't always that obvious. In verse 8 of Luke 14, Jesus says this, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. In verse 12, when you give a banquet, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read these things, I, I, I don't I don't see this really horrible, terrible thing going on. Do you? You know, first of all, uh, anybody else struggle with, like, where to sit, you know, when you go to a wedding? I mean, have you ever got to a wedding, like, where the ushers are really not doing their job, right? They're supposed, what are they supposed to ask you when you go to a wedding? They're supposed to ask you, are you a friend of the bride, a friend of the groom? You sit on one side or the other. They're supposed to try to figure out, you know, whether you're a relative, right? And the closer you are to the family, the farther up front you're supposed to sit, right? But have you ever got to the wedding and the ushers weren't doing their job or you got there early? And so the whole place is open and it, it, where do I sit? I want the best seat that I can get. If you're by the way, guys, we don't get this at all, okay, I, for the most part. But our, our female friends, our wives, they want to get a seat not only up close, but they want a seat on the aisle wide so they can take a picture as the bride walks by, right? Did I just make an enemy of every woman in here? That's how it is at my place, all right? So we have this thing even today, 2,000 years later. I go to a wedding, where do I sit? Um, or how about this? Second example, not so obvious. What's wrong with giving dinner to somebody who maybe sometime could give dinner back to you? Is there anything wrong with that? Does that seem like terrible? Have you ever been, you know, to a place where you're at a restaurant and your friend picks up the tab? It does happen sometimes, okay? Okay. They, they, somebody else pays for your meal. Do you ever have the instinct to immediately say, hey, next time it's my turn? Right? What do we say? There, there's this kind of social thing that goes on where we say, okay, you can pay today, but I pay the next time. Well, 
I think Jesus here is tapping into these social norms that we all have. And if you're like me and you read this, you say, well, man, what, what's the big deal here? What's, what's Jesus talking about? Not necessarily really, you know, on the evil scale, really horribly terrible evil, right? Just maybe sometimes not necessarily the best choice. So should we really care that much about making the best choice? Jesus sure seems to think so. Why is that? So if you're a filler in the blanker, here's your, here's we're going to detour from the passage a little bit just to understand this. And kids, this is where I really want you to kind of grab hold of this because I think this could help you later on. Even when I become a Christ follower, I hope you're all, you're all Christians, right? You're all, you want to follow Jesus, right? Well, here's the thing. Even when we are Christ followers, we still retain something called a sin nature, okay? A sin nature. That means that our inclination, okay, that's a big word. That means that our intention, okay, wait a minute, that's another big word. That means the thing that we normally like to think about, the things that we normally think that we want to do, tend to be often the wrong thing to do, okay? Um, you know, when, when you are at school and there is a line and it's for something good, do you want to be at the front of the line or the back of the line? Oh, man, I want to get up there front. I want to get the very best spot that I can get, right? In other words, there is, an ink, there is, a, there is, a, there is a thing inside of us that says, I want for me. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I like. I want to think of myself first. Okay, that's what's called a sin nature. And as beautiful as you are, you all have it. We're all born with it. As beautiful as you all are, as nicely as you're groomed today, you all have this sin nature. It's so easy to let pride and self-righteousness, thinking of ourselves first, color all of our thinking. But if we have this in nature, what we have to understand is our thinking can sometimes be wrong even when it seems right. Right? Jeremiah 17, 9, a couple of verses that I think will help us here. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You guys ever send Valentine cards, right? And you do the little heart thing. I love you. I love you. You're my friend. You're my friend. You're my friend. You're my friend. Right? The heart. The heart is who we are. The heart is the heart of us. The thing that's really important to us. And the Bible says... That the heart is deceitful. You know what deceitful means? It means like when we pretend to do one thing, but we really do another. When we think like we're looking good and really we're looking bad. When we really want to do the wrong thing, but we want to look like we're doing the right thing. Okay? That's called the heart being deceitful. The inside of us even lies to ourself. Here's another verse, 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, okay, now again, kids, this would mean, if we claim that we aren't this way, that we aren't selfish, that we aren't focused on the wrong things instead of the right things, okay? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That literally means that we lie to us. Now, I know that your folks have always taught you that you shouldn't lie to people. And it's true. Uh, one of, when I was a kid, one time I told a lie to my dad, and man, he caught me in it. And then I, I you know, he, <laughs> he just kind of played the whole thing out. Well, if that's true, then, and then I found I had to lie about something else. 
And then I had to lie about something. You ever been in a situation where you just had to lie upon lie upon lie upon lie? I mean, it just gets worse. It's like, man, I, it would have been so much better if I just told the truth to begin with. As bad as all that is, the Bible says that there are times when we lie to us. It's one thing to lie to somebody else, but it's another thing when you lie to you because then you can't even believe what you say. You're not sure whether you're telling yourself the truth or not. Now, let's put these two verses together just for a moment. The heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure. Who can understand it? And then if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not enough. Put those two together, and what we get is this. Our hearts, our attitudes, our opinions, our notion of what's right and what's wrong, of what's sinful and what's not sinful of the good things that we should be doing, the bad things that we shouldn't be doing. That sense of what we have within ourselves itself isn't always right. What seems right sometimes isn't right. What seems wrong sometimes is right. It's really confusing. It's like a compass. You ever have a compass and follow compass? You know, the compass has a magnetic thing that always points to north. And so if you have a compass and you know that it's always pointing north, you know which way to go if you want to go east or west or south. But what if you had a compass that pointed the wrong way? What if you had a compass that was supposed to point north and instead it pointed south? And you were following that compass. Sometimes that's what it's like for us when we're not sure about exactly what is right or wrong. We're doomed to be living without righteousness. Even when we think we know what we should do, we struggle even to do what we think is right. Now, I know this is all confusing, and you wonder where the heck I'm going, but you stick with me, okay? Hopefully, we get a conclusion before the day's over. I want to have you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Now, this is, <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul talking. This is a guy who wrote close to two-thirds of the non-gospel New Testament, okay? So you take the gospels out, the New Testament, what you have left, is mostly written by the Apostle Paul. He really is a guy who helped shape our thinking about what Christianity is and how we live out our best Christian life. Now, here's what Paul, okay, now, if there were like a, if there were, if there were a pedestal upon which we could put the most perfect non-Christ Christian, because <laughs> Jesus would be the best, right? He'd be like the winner. But Paul, he would be like this next best guy, okay? So you understand what I'm, what I'm saying, guys? All right? And here's what Paul says in Romans 7, 18 and 19. Now, kids, see if this doesn't sound like how life really is sometimes for ourselves. Here's what he says. I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my, what's he say, sinful nature. Do you see that? Then he says this, I, I have this desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Oh, my goodness. The Apostle Paul is confessing to all of us 2,000 years later that even he, as good a guy as he is, doesn't always get it right, doesn't always do it right. That even as a Christian who wrote about what it means to be a Christian, even the guy who told us all the things that we should be doing right and all the things that we shouldn't be doing this wrong, he says, I have this desire to do it, but I can't always do it. I can't always do what's right. I can't always do what's good. <laughs> now, I have personally found these verses from Paul to be both humbling and helpful. Because Paul was well into living out his Christian life when he wrote this letter. This was not like he wrote this early on. He has been a Christian for a very long time. And yet he says that he still has this sinful nature inside of him and that he can't always carry out the good that he desires to do and that he would do evil instead of good. What a state. Does anybody else, get the, does anybody else feel this frustration? 
You know, I think sometimes we, we come to church and we put our halos on. And we just kind of, you know, adjust it just right. We get our faces all looking good. We get scrubbed up. Put a little gel in our hair. Okay. And, you know, we come to church and we smile. And it's like, man, everything in my life is just, ooh, just hunky-dory. I have got up every morning. I've read my Bible every day. I've prayed my prayers every day. I've helped out everybody that I could help out. I just lived the most perfect Christian life you could ever see. And we're perfect here for about an hour and a half. And then we leave and we keep on doing all the stuff that we've been doing all week long. Is anybody else tired of that? I am. I want church to be a community, a place where we can go and be honest with one another, where we know that there are people who really love us and who say, even though you've got some problems, my brothers and sisters, I I love you anyway. And let me tell you something. I've got some problems of my own. I've got some things that I'm dealing with. And I'd appreciate it not only if I'd pray for you, but I'd appreciate it if you'd pray for me. Now, I don't want to leave you all in frustration because we don't have to live our lives in frustration. Christ did give us three things that can help us when we have this sinful nature that we still have. We will have it all the way until we die, okay? God says that there come a time when we get a new body when we don't have the sinful nature anymore. But until then, so long as we're living on this earth, Even if we're Christian, we're going to have this sinful nature. So how do we handle it? What does the Bible tell us that we should do? All right, I'm going to tell you three advantages. Yes, as a Christian, you still have a sinful nature. You still have the desire to do the wrong thing. How do you counter it? How do you handle? Kids, how do you, when when you want to do something that's really bad, when you want to get back even with somebody, when somebody treated you the wrong way, when they said something bad about you, and your every inclination is to say something bad back to them, okay? You know where I'm talking about, right? How do you do the right thing instead of the wrong thing? How do you even know what the right thing is? Well, the Bible tells us we have three advantages. We have three things. If we're Christian, yeah, we still have the sinful nature, but we have three things that we can count on. Let me tell you what those three things are. The first thing is, advantage number one, is I have God's Holy Spirit within me. Now, the Holy Spirit is actually God himself. When we talk about God, we talk about God the Father, we talk about God the Son, and we talk about God the Holy Spirit. We call that the Trinity, that there's actually three persons, but one God. I know, that's confusing. But the reason for the Holy Spirit, just thinking practically for a moment, is that when Jesus died, he gave up his Holy Spirit, and he said that it would actually be good for us that we would have his Spirit living inside of us. So that if you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, you get God's Holy Spirit joining in with you. When we say, Jesus, come into my heart, that's literally what we mean. We're really saying, your spirit joined together with my spirit. Now, is that cool or what? That you actually kind of have God along for the ride with you. Everyone who receives Christ, everybody who really is a Christian, is someone who has God, the spirit, going with them everywhere they go. Let me read a verse for you. Again, the same Paul, right, who wrote the other thing. He wrote this in Romans 8, verse 9. You, however, talking about you Christians, and so if you're a Christ follower, he's talking to you, and you, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, meaning the physical, okay, but you are in the realm of the spirit, If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, then they do not belong to Christ. Okay, that's as clear as you can say it. If you're a Christ follower, you've got Christ. You've got his Spirit with you. If you don't have his Spirit, you don't have Christ. Now, what does this really mean? Practically, kids. Okay, okay, I I get the Holy Spirit. 
I have the Holy Spirit with me. So now I'm in this decision-making mode, and I want to get back. I want to get even with somebody. I want to get mad at somebody. How does having God's Holy Spirit help me? Simply this. When you have God's Holy Spirit with you, you have God's wisdom. Even though you don't know everything that's going on in the world, he does. You have God's voice inside of your head speaking to you. Even though you don't always have the correct sense of what's right and wrong, because sometimes things seem awfully gray and not black and white, God's Holy Spirit always knows the right thing to do. And God's Spirit is within you. Even when the choice is not obvious to you, it's obvious to him. Jesus told us that his Spirit would always bring to our minds his commandments of how we should be living. By the way, that means you guys should all be reading your Bibles. Okay, you want to make sure you read your Bibles because that's how we know what God's commandments are. And then God's Spirit brings that to your mind. So we have advantage number one. We have God's Spirit within us that can help us handle knowing what's right and wrong and to do the right and not do the wrong. Here's the second advantage that we have. And this is really good too. We actually have God's power. God's power. Jesus says... In Acts 1.8, he says, you, again, talking to you Christians, you Christians, you Christians, you, all of you, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, let me put these first two things together, okay? If it's true, as the Bible tells us, that when we become Christians, we receive God's Holy Spirit, and then the second thing, when we receive God's Holy Spirit, guess what we also get? we get his power. Jesus doesn't just give you his spirit so that we will know the right from the wrong and then just go ahead and do the wrong thing anyway. God gives us his spirit so that we not only know right from wrong, but that we have the power to do the right thing. We have the power to, to say something good to somebody even when every inclination in our body says, no, I want to get even with you. That would be God's power because my tongue would want to say something really, really bad. So, God, your tongue, you speak through me. (laughs) Give me not only the wisdom but the power to make the right choice. Here's the cool thing, kids. Even though we have this sinful nature inside of us and we never get rid of it, the Bible tells us that we have a choice. We actually do have a choice. If you, if you don't have Jesus' spirit in you, you really don't have a choice. If you're not a Christian, you just kind of do what feels right. You go along with the crowd. You just kind of say whatever. But when you've got God's spirit inside of you, you know right from wrong. You hear from him. You can hear his voice inside of you. And you have the power to do the right and not the wrong. You actually do have a choice. So when your mom and dad says to you, You had the choice. You could have done the other. Instead, you did this. You need to think to this talk today and say, you know, I remember when Pastor Mark told me that I've got God's Holy Spirit, his power inside of me, and that I can make the right choice and the best choice, and I can live that choice out. By the way, moms and dads who's training up these youngsters, same goes for you, right? We have God's power. We have the Holy Spirit to make the right choice. We have the power to make the right choice. And then here's advantage number three, and it just goes with this whole thing we're talking about. We also have God's freedom. We have God's freedom. Romans 8 again. This is from Paul, the same guy. (laughs) Don't you love it that he wrote both chapters? He didn't stop at chapter 7, but he went on to chapter 8. The same guy that says that he struggled sometimes with sin, sometimes did the wrong thing. Here's what he also says in verse 2 of chapter 8. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit. Let's stop there for a moment. What's the law of the Spirit? Again, the Spirit of Christ that lives within me. I can live by his law instead of the law of everything else that tells me what's right and wrong. The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, the real difference between the authentic Christ follower and anyone else in the whole world is that kids, moms and dads, you are not bound by sin. 
You are not controlled by sin. Yes, you still have your sinful nature. Yes, you still have the desire sometimes to do the wrong thing. And yes, sometimes you will mess up. But you are no longer bound to do the wrong thing. You are no longer bound to not do the right thing. God's spirit and his power in your life have literally set you free so that you can not only live the best life possible, but you can encourage others to do the same thing. So you have God's Holy Spirit. This brings us to this real issue, and we're going to kind of come back to Luke here, okay? This brings us to the real issue that I think Jesus presents to us. Because some of you right now think, what in the world does this have with the right seat at a wedding? <laughs> or what in the world does this all have to do with, you know, giving a banquet to people who can only give a banquet back to me? These two issues, I think, are given to us not as clear-cut, here's the right thing and the wrong thing. I think these are both examples of how to live out our Christian life. It's not just about being humble or being humiliated. It's not just about eating with my friends or feeding the hungry. It's bigger than all of that. Jesus is actually presenting us with a strategy for living, a means by which we might access that Holy Spirit. Remember, I told you you have the Holy Spirit within you? What good does it do if you can't get to him? What good if it does it do you if you can't hear him? So Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you a means by which you can access God's Spirit within you that you might have his power, that you might have his freedom from sin and death. And here's the strategy. It's simply this. It's your point number four. To live as a Christian sometimes means to intentionally do the opposite of what comes naturally. Big point. Sometimes you do the opposite of what comes naturally. And we see it here in verse 10 and 13. Let me read it for you. Again, Jesus is talking. When you're invited to this wedding feast, when you're invited, you take the lowest place. You, you don't take the seat of honor. You take the worst seat. You do the opposite of what is your inclination. You want to sit up front. You want to sit on the aisle. You sit in the back. And then the next day when you go to church, you say, you know what? I have this inclination to sit in the back. I want to do the opposite and sit up front. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we'll stop there. Or how about this in verse 13? Do the opposite. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. So why is that the opposite? Because typically, when you're putting together a, a party, don't you want to invite the, the folks that make the party the funnest that it could possibly be, that you like to hang around with, who probably would maybe bring a little of the extra, you know, you know, you know how it goes, right? Somebody comes in with this, with this cheesecake that you're dying to eat, and you literally say, you lie on top of everything else, oh, you didn't have to do that. No. Our inclination is to hang out with the people that we like to hang out with. And Jesus is saying, sometimes you got to do the opposite. When I'm invited to a big social event and I arrive early and all the seats are before me, my most natural response is to grab the best seat in the house. But instead, with the power, the presence, the freedom of God's Holy Spirit, I make a different choice. I might make a choice for the lowest place. Or when I throw a party and I don't invite just those who make me look good, I throw an opposite party. I do the opposite. I invite other people who wouldn't normally be the ones I would think about first. This idea of, of literally all of our thoughts, all of our inclinations, every thought we've ever had being wrong... And that we have to do the opposite was found in the first chapter of Gospel 1 of George Costanza. I think it's funny. And like really good comedy, this points to an admission of truth that we find within ourselves. Did you pick up what George said? Let me read this back to you so you can see how this fits with what we're talking about today. My life 
is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of my life, it's all been wrong. And in that, George is right. (laughs) This is what real humility is all about. When you learn to be humble, to admit that I am flawed, to admit that I've got this sin nature inside of me, to admit that my choices are not always the best choices, to admit that I'm not living my very best life that I could possibly be living, to admit that I'm not necessarily doing what either pleases me or pleases my Heavenly Father. That's what we're talking about, that I and you and you need help, okay? We just need help. If if it's true that we're born with this sinful nature, if it's true that we never get rid of the sinful nature while we're alive, even though we're a Christian, and so we have God's spirit within us, we still have the sinful nature too. We've got this struggle, and it's humble. It's humility to admit that I need help. So on your programs, we've got number four and we've got number three. We got to combine those two together. It's kind of funny to watch this clip to just do the opposite, but just to do the opposite all the time by itself doesn't work, right? We have to admit, yes, our natural inclinations are wrong oftentimes. And so we direct our assumptions about what's right and what's wrong up to God's Spirit, who, by the way, happens to be within me. We ask Him for His wisdom, we ask Him for His power. We ask him for his freedom from sin. Some of you who are struggling with the same sin over and over again, it just seems like you can't. Have you asked God for freedom? Have you said, will you set me free? And yes, there are times where in order to do this, we have to on purpose do the exact opposite of what at first seems natural until living out this selfless Life of Christianity actually feels more natural than the selfishness that is within us. This doing the opposite, by the way, I snuck this in on you because none of you really know what we call an official Christianese. You know, in Christianity, we have to have official words. And we can't just say do the opposite. So we have official Christian words. And here's the official Christian word for doing the opposite. They're called spiritual disciplines. Oh, bing, 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 bing. The light's just gone off above my head. Spiritual disciplines. We tend to think of spiritual disciplines as things like reading the Bible or praying. But anything that we do to discipline ourselves to become more like Christ can be a spiritual discipline. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Let me read this to you. This should be, kids, this would be one of those verses that you should like write down and just remember, Okay. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. In other words, do the thing that doesn't seem the easy thing. Do the thing that doesn't seem the natural thing. Do the opposite sometimes of what you feel like doing for the purpose of being more like God. Godliness. Anyone who has ever disciplined themselves in any area of their life, knows that at first especially, that discipline seems completely foreign. It feels opposite. It just literally feels wrong, hard. Whoever wants to get their body in shape and says, you know, I know that in order to get in shape, I I have to start running and you haven't run for a very long time, you feel like you're going to die. It's the opposite of what naturally happens. And the more you discipline yourself, the more you do what you don't feel like doing, 
the more you, you don't eat what you feel like eating, the more you exercise when you didn't want to exercise. Whatever the discipline is, the more that you do it, the easier that it gets and the more natural it becomes. And spiritual discipline, kids, are exactly the same way. When you say, you know, I really want to be like God, I really want to be the best me that God made me to be, how do I do that? Sometimes I got to do the opposite. And that may sound spiritual, but really, it's just like any other discipline. So if I struggle, for example, with wanting the best seat in the house, guess what I do? I take deliberately the back seat in the house. If I struggle with wanting people to pay back to me the things that, you know, I do that are good for them, then I purposely do good things for people who could never possibly pay me back. That's a spiritual discipline. If I struggle with impatience, anybody here struggle with impatience? You're looking at one of the most impatient pastors you're ever going to meet. You know what you do to struggle with impatience? You, you, you get in the slow line. You look at all the lines at Kroger. I, I don't know about you, but here's how it works for me. My natural inclination is I do an evaluation, and I'm really good at it. That person there has got more groceries, but that checker outer is really fast, and she's got a bagger. This person over here doesn't have as much, but I can tell they're checking out some wine, and that kid's a teenager, and we're going to have to do a price check. <laughs> and so I look for the fastest line. When I'm driving my car, I can tell that sometimes the best way to get around this car is to go around the right side, not the left side. Even if I have to pass a truck doing it, is there's three lanes and I can beat that lane over there. And, I, and, and, and for whatever reason, I could be driving 700 miles that day, but that one minute, I win that race. So if you're impatient like me, you know what a spiritual discipline is? You do that evaluation in the Kroger line, and then you get in the longest line on purpose. You set your speed limit thing for less than the fastest speed that you can go. And then you just forget about it. That's a spiritual discipline. If I struggle with ingratitude, you know what I do? I do the opposite. I, I write thank you letters every day. I say, you know, I, I know that I'm not appreciative of the good things. Every day I'm going to write three letters saying thank you to somebody who's done something kind to me. I struggle with putting God first in my life. I get up early, and the very first thing that I do before I do anything else is I think about God, I pray to God, I read his word. I struggle with my financial faith. I do the opposite. I pay my tithe first, and I trust God to take care of the rest. That is a spiritual discipline. Do you see what I'm saying here? In every aspect of our lives, we evaluate, am I becoming more like God or less like God? Am I becoming better, my better self or my worse self? And what is it that I can do with God's help to get over whatever it is that I struggle with? Do the opposite. With God's presence, with God's power, and with God's freedom. Thank you.